Hello everyone. Hope you're all doing well. Welcome and thank you for taking out the time out of your really busy day to join this webinar brought to you by Peony. My name is Shalini and I'm the marketing manager for India at Peony. We are really excited to have Tally, a key player in providing ERP solutions for IT SMBs and LegalWiz.in, that's an online legal solutions partner with us as a speaker panel for today. So our webinar, Expanding IT Services Business and Processes with Technology has some really exciting agenda. Like the topic of the webinar suggests, in today's session, the speakers will cover tools and best practices to expand your services business overseas. Let me give a little brief on what we'll be covering in today's session. We'll be talking about exploring foreign entity incorporation in challenges space while venturing into global markets, also ensuring compliance while setting up a foreign entity. We'll also talk about best practices for handling cross-border IT services and first practices in outsourcing the accounting function. So I'm really excited to have Mr. Sriji and Mr. Pugal as our speakers, with Mr. Sriji as our first speaker for today. A little brief about his profile before I hand over the session to him. So Mr. Sriji is an e-commerce and digital commerce veteran with over 12 years of experience and three ventures to his name. He currently runs LegalWiz.in, a legal tech company that helps startups and SMEs with business professional services and legal compliances. As of today, LegalWiz.in supports 7,000 plus clients across India and has some of the most prominent startups in Gujarat as clients. He's best known for his people skills, analytical approach, business acumen, and candy attitude. Thank you so much for being here, Mr. Sriji. Before I hand over the session to Mr. Sriji, I request all the participants to share their queries in the Q&A section, which we'll be addressing at the end of the session. I'm so sorry I interrupted you there, Mr. Sriji. Please, uh, OT. Uh, thank you so much for, for a very warm welcome and uh, uh, glad to be part of the webinar with uh, Peony Rantelli. Uh, thanks a lot for having me today, and uh, I hope to add you know value. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, you know while uh, uh, we are presenting, definitely feel free to kind of put that in the chat box, and we can uh, take the Q and A session right after the after the presentations. Um, so with that, uh, let me just share my screens real quick, and uh, we can get started. Um, uh, is my screen shared? Yes, uh, Mr. Sriji. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, so we are going to talk about, uh, uh, you know, expanding IT services. Uh, obviously, as we uh, all know, most of the IT companies, whether that is, uh, you know, into ITS or uh, even digital marketing services or other branding consultation services and, uh, and other services business in general, uh, there is a tremendous scope in uh, acquiring clients from overseas. Um, and uh, uh, there has been some specific questions about, you know, how how do we structure that? How to, you know, kind of set up the entity if at all we need to set up an overseas entity or, or do we really need to set up an overseas entity uh, to start with? And uh, so these are some of the, uh, you know, questions that we are going to answer today along with uh, then Pukalji kind of taking a deeper dive into how to set up best practices in accounting and how tele can, uh, you know, help in, uh, uh, making it easier for the businesses. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, when we think about the export of services, right, and uh, uh, and people, uh, you know, providing their services to overseas clients, uh, from a definitional standpoint, um, you know, GST uh, kind of defines, and earlier it used to be service tax, and then now it is, uh, you know, obviously GST uh, beyond 2017, uh, there are some key criteria on how you would define a service to be an export of services versus not. Uh, as we um, you know, talk about export of services, it is uh, interesting to know that all the export of services uh, fall under zero rated services uh, as defined under the IGST Act. Um, and when I say it is a zero rated services, that means that uh, GST is not applicable or it is 0% GST is applicable, um, right? So the definitional criteria for qualifying of exporter is, of a service is uh, obviously the supplier has to be in India and rendering the services outside India, which is very, uh, you know, self-explanatory. Um, at the same time, the, the payment of such services, uh, you know, need to be uh, happening in a foreign convertible uh, currency and uh, you know obviously very recently uh, since the government also has uh, uh, 
uh, you know, in some cases, um, they also permit uh, specifically through uh, Reserve Bank of India, if at all the uh, payment has been, um, you know, realized in Indian rupees. But uh, generally speaking, most of us do realize, um, you know, the export of services payments uh, in some sort of foreign convertible currency, whether that is in USD or uh, any other, uh, you know, foreign, foreign currency. Uh, and finally, uh, you know, the supplier of services and the recipient of the services are not uh, you know, merely an establishment uh, of a distinct person. Uh, you know, when when we talk about that, it is basically it is not uh, you know just an entity that is created uh, you know to take advantage of uh, export of services provisions, but uh, you know something that that genuinely qualifies an export of service. Um, right. So uh, so having said that, uh, there are two major ways how. Uh, you know, the Indian establishments or the companies would export their services. Uh, most of, um, you know, us would uh, have overseas clients who are directly uh, paying, uh, you know, to the company in foreign convertible currency and purely it being an export of services. Uh, at the same time, a lot of other companies or a lot of larger companies, they do, uh, you know, sort of explore an option of having a sales office or an establishment in the foreign land. Uh, and essentially that becomes, uh, you know, either their sales engine, wherein, um, you know, most of their service rendering happens still from India. So in other words, they have, uh, you know, developers or designers or uh, marketeers or other workforce that is hired in India. Uh, obviously on Indian payroll and they establish an entity uh, in foreign land, for example, uh, either a US, uh, uh, you know, Delaware C Corp or, uh, or you know, a, a company in, in uh, Singapore or uh, anything like that. Uh, so those are two primary ways how uh, people manage international business. Um, when we think about establishing an entity in uh, the foreign land, obviously uh, it can either be, you know, a, foreign uh, parent Indian subsidiary or vice versa situation, uh, or it can be an independent arm, uh, you know, uh, in, in which uh, the Indian entity essentially have some sort of relationship at the arm's length uh, with the with the company that is, or uh, the corporation that's been established uh, overseas, right? Um, so while, you know, we think about what approach one or the other is better for us, uh, there are some key criteria that we would want to uh, explore more, right? So what are the advantages uh, or why would anyone think of establishing uh, their, uh, you know, company or organization uh, in the foreign land, right? So the so most obvious advantages uh, are if you are trying to create a local brand in the international market, right? It definitely uh, makes a lot of sense to uh, have something which is more tangible to your clients. Um, uh, it also helps you in terms of, uh, you know, defining your contracts because uh, some of your clients might also, you know, shy away from, um, you know, contracting with a foreign incorporation. Uh, they might be, uh, you know, more uh, comfortable dealing with the rules and regulations and law of the uh, homeland. And in that case, obviously, uh, you know, they might want to prefer uh, somebody who is already incorporated locally, right? Um, uh, also, uh, you know, there are taxation advantages in some cases. So uh, while you are choosing a country for incorporation, uh, there are some countries which offer you uh, really good tax advantages as opposed to the others, uh, right? So countries, uh, you know, like uh, Dubai free trade zone or Singapore, uh, these countries have uh, very good tax advantages. Uh, you know, so they the, these countries are known for offering tax advantages, tax havens. Um, so the earnings that you, uh, you know, sort of your earning potential and your profit potentials really maximize. Uh, so if taxation is something that you would want to explore and you would want to, you know, save taxes, then obviously that becomes one of the other considerations why uh, you would want to uh, have a foreign corporation. Uh, obviously, if you want to hire local talent, uh, if you uh, have employee base that you would want to set up in, in international countries, and obviously that becomes another consideration. Um, a lot of times uh, it is perceived that if it is a purely an outsourcing job, it comes at an outsourcing rate, as opposed to if you have a local entity, uh, 
uh, and a representation, then obviously you would be able to negotiate better rates with a uh, on ground servicing and, and physical connectivity. Uh, so that's another consideration. If uh, if that is becoming the rate justification is becoming a challenge, then obviously that might be a solution to it where uh, you have more tangible, uh, you know, sort of solution that is available in the in the local lands of your clients. Um, eventually, a lot of uh, uh, you know, private equity, um, a lot of venture capitalists, they would want to uh, invest in more mature markets. Uh, so if at all you are, you know, in process of raising funds, uh, you would find that some of the PEs and venture capitalists uh, would want to invest, um, you know, in, in, in entities which are, uh, which are rather established in countries where the law enforcement and establishment is a lot better right and uh, uh, so that might be you know one another reason why you know you would see companies like flipkart and so on and so forth they are you know incorporated uh, in singapore as opposed to their major business really comes from india um, so that might be another consideration why you would want uh, you know foreign incorporation um, and finally while you are doing all of these uh, and there are definitely some obvious advantages of having an incorporation in india you would also want to weigh this benefits against uh you know the compliance burdens or the maintenance hassles or uh you know keeping up with a local law of an international uh you know uh territory uh in mind so if if your advantages are outweighing your uh you know resources that you are going to deploy on making sure that you stay legally compliant and secured uh, in the foreign land then obviously it makes sense for you to uh, you know go ahead and uh, and establish an overseas entity uh, to procure business or to service business um, as such um so so now let's you know kind of focus on the option one which is essentially purely an export of services which is uh, where your entity is um based in india india and uh, your entity is serving clients which are uh, from overseas um in that case obviously you know the regular compliances whether it is a private limited company or an llp uh, you know your, your annual compliances and and things like those that that will definitely apply but uh, over and above uh, you know some of the pointers that you would want to make sure that uh, you know you comply with or or at least you have a consideration to is first thing first uh, as i mentioned um, uh, your export of services as qualification that uh, falls under a zero rated service under igst act uh, and what the, what does that mean is usually where your business professional services or your it consultation services fall under 18 percent of gst bracket uh, if you are exporting those services you can take a benefit of invoicing at a zero percent uh, gst uh, and export of services remain zero rated or exempt in that sense uh, for that you definitely have to have a gst registration uh, even though you have not crossed uh, you know your uh, gst uh, qualification, uh, you know, trade volume or the turnover, uh, you would still have to have a GST registration to be able to qualify as a zero rated service. Along with that, uh, something which is called a LUT or a letter of undertaking uh, is essential, um, you know, uh, to uh, to have in place uh, if you are if you are taking an advantage of that. Um, while you receive uh, the funds, uh, whether you are receiving the funds through PayPal or Payoneer or I, I really hope that it is Payoneer, uh, one of the very premium and fantastic services that they that they provide to collect uh, money from across the globe. Um, if you are collecting payments, uh, you know, in uh, in such accounts, or if you are collecting payments, uh, you know, through uh, through a regular wire transfers in the bank, uh, it is important that you obtain uh, an FIRC uh, copy and uh, keep that for your records uh, to you know justify the payments that have been received and, and you are being compliant with the RBI norms. Um, also, while you are accepting a payment, it is important to attach a particular purpose code to it, right? So uh, there is a list of purpose codes, uh, you know, which differs from business activity to activity, uh, whether that is money that is received to uh, you know, for the maintenance of the Indian subsidiary, or that is towards the payment of certain type of services, whether that is IT, uh, ES services, or design services, or accounting outsourcing services, and so on and so forth. Uh, so every every business activity in in uh, in that case has a different purpose code, and so you are attaching a right purpose code uh, for bringing the money in. 
the most important thing uh, over here to uh, make sure uh, is uh, to also have appropriate contracts and uh, invoicing structure. Uh, and I'm sure, uh, uh, you know, while uh, uh, Pugalji is going to talk more about the invoicing and uh, e-invoicing, um, I'll, I'll touch briefly upon that and, and more importantly in the contract, right? So uh, there's several different clauses that you would want to uh make sure that they exist in your service level agreements or the service contracts uh primarily the jurisdiction that you uh you know select so uh if at all the contract goes in dispute then uh then how do you fight it out or defend it right and most while most of your clients would impose uh that your jurisdiction falls under um under the foreign land obviously you would want to kind of rethink and if you have uh, a negotiation over it i would ideally you know suggest to have it in the homeland so if at all it goes into a dispute uh, you can challenge that in the local court more importantly uh, because it is in the home court uh, obviously you have uh, you know an inherited advantage of being local and obviously minimizing your cost to uh, you know take take up the legal uh, you know, legal battle at that point of time. So, uh, so that could be one of it. And and apart from that, obviously, your service level agreement should be detailed enough to, uh, you know, outline, uh, you know, your uh, your work order, your payment schedules, your, um, you know, if if you are billing by hours, uh, then how are you going to manage? you know, the hourly time sheets, or if it is an FTE that is being sold, uh, then what is the tracking system uh, that you have in place? Uh, what is the reasonableness in that? And uh, to what extent uh, your client can interfere in that and um, those sort of things. Also, it, uh, you know, kind of attaches an SOW or a statement of work, wherein uh, what is the exact outcome that you are, uh, you know, you are supposed to provide and what are the timelines to that? And if you, if it is on a project basis, uh, then what are the complications that could occur if the, uh, if the timelines are not being met and how do you define that to be a blocker from an input from a client side versus, uh, something where, uh, you know, fall, you fall under the breach of contract, wherein, uh, simply you are not able to, you know, meet those timelines or the, uh, standards of quality and so on and so forth. <clears throat> So while a lot of people, uh, you know, as as I have observed, uh, you know, uh, if it is really a small scale uh, ITS company, they usually tend to, uh, you know, download uh, copies of SLAs off of Google. Uh, I would very highly suggest and recommend having that vetted through a good lawyer uh, or drafted it uh, through a good service um, uh, wherein your interests are secured. Uh, and if at all it goes into a dispute and uh, you have to you know, take legal help, uh, then at least that should be defendable. So uh, if at all, uh, while you are building your practice um, in an overseas market, one investment that you would really want to make uh, is to uh really get a good sla drafted for yourself uh which makes sure that you are uh, legally secured and covered uh, and and that is probably one of the key takeaways from what i'm going to talk about today uh, because most of the small ITS companies they kind of ignore that and uh, when it actually goes into a dispute then they don't really have a defendable position uh, as such so uh, so i think that is a that is a key takeaway from from this slide um, then obviously we are going to talk more largely about um, if, uh, you know, while you are weighing all of your options, uh, you really think that, um, you know, foreign entity uh, is an option for you, right? Then uh, you should ideally first uh, do an exercise and choose for what benefits are you going to establish a foreign entity, right? And what foreign land uh, is the most appropriate for you, right? So if you are considering taxation purposes, then obviously, uh, you know, you are looking at Singapore, you're looking at uh, Dubai free trade, RAK, uh, Ras Al Khaimah, or, uh, you know, the free trade zones, uh, stuff like that. If you are trying to access Asian capital, private equity firms, then Singapore becomes a great option. Uh, if you are primarily serving US-based clientele, uh, or you want, you know, rather straightforward compliances, uh, Delaware is a great option in the US uh, to incorporate a C-Corp. Um, so, so, so depending on what benefit are you trying to get, uh, you know, you would want to pick and choose the country that 
uh, that serves the best purpose, right? The second thing is then obviously you go into uh, selecting what is the entity that makes most sense for you, right? So specifically taking an example of let's say US and uh, uh, there could be two different options. Either you could do an LLC or you could do a C Corp. Uh, an S Corp is rather, uh, you know, something that is not very, uh, you know, wisely available option for uh, foreign nationals to incorporate in the US at least. Uh, so C Corp and LLC becomes uh, your ideal options uh, out of which a lot of times people would rather go with a C Corp uh, for the reason being it is more of a corporate structure wherein uh, you know your taxation uh, is managed at the corporate level and not passed through the individuals uh, which are the members of an LL LLC. Uh, and there are obviously other nuances, uh, right? So while you are deciding on a particular structure you would want to definitely consult somebody who is well versed of local laws and uh, and really can guide you through that process rather than uh, you know going with what everybody is doing so uh, that is very important um, if we talk about um, you know uh, compliances in the US and you have your federal filing, you have your state returns filing. Uh, there are registrations which would be required in, in terms of uh, uh, your uh, TIN or tax identification number, your EIN, which is your employer identification number, lets you hire employees uh, and so on and so forth. So every country will have its own requirements of um, you know government registrations and filing uh, requirements. So while you pick and choose the country as well as the uh, business entity formation type, uh, you should always know what are the compliance requirements and burdens that are coming along uh, and make sure that you comply with that uh, and, and for that you have a right kind of consultation that is available, uh, you know, rather than not being compliant because uh, the, the penalties and the uh, and the interest and uh, other uh, financial lot losses may be a lot higher and at that point of time being in a foreign land it becomes a, a very hassle process to kind of, uh, you know, go through all of that. Now, um, let's say if you have an entity in the US and then you have an entity uh, in India, whether that is two independent entities or that, that is a foreign uh, parent Indian subsidiary, uh, you know, sort of a structure, uh, you would also want to establish a transfer pricing mechanism, right? So ideally most of the, uh, most of the organizations, what they do is they have their development or their uh, manpower staffing in India. Uh, and then they have a sales office in the, in the US or other, uh, you know, Western country, uh, which essentially uh, is bringing in sales for you, but the service rendering happens from India, right? Uh, so it happens from India to the US entity. And finally, the invoicing happens from the US entity in, in, in our example case. Uh, so in that case, it is very important to establish a transfer pricing, which is essentially defining that what is the rate at which your Indian entity is going to provide services to your uh, US entity, right? And, and why this is very important is because if you don't make enough margin on an Indian entity, it is essentially qualifying as evasion of taxes, right? And that is not something that you would want to uh, fall into, uh, you know, the, the government's radar um, and, and definitely not follow the best practices. Uh, so some of the best practices to establish a transfer pricing is, either a comparable uncontrolled price, which is something where if you were to go in the open market and procure the pricing for that, what would that be? And, and at that point of time, it transfers at that, that pricing. Uh, a lot of companies for the, for the sake of ease also go with a cost plus fixed percentage sort of method. So uh, typically in the range of 15 to 25% is, is what usually people, uh, you know, ballpark for an IT, IDES company. Uh, but the transfer pricing essentially defines that uh, it covers all the cost of running that operations in India. Plus what is the reasonable margin that your kind of business usually makes in India and that becomes your transfer pricing, um, you know, to pass on your work from an Indian entity to a US entity. Uh, at, at whatever transfer pricing, the invoicing happens on a regular basis. Say it is happening on a monthly basis uh, and you're taking the remittance in. Um, you should also make sure that the invoicing is regular, uh, justifiable, and uh, it is following the best uh, practices in the transfer pricing uh, that you that you establish. Uh, the other important point that you would want to think of is if your primary clientele 
is residing in the foreign land, you also would want to secure your intellectual property. So when we talk about intellectual properties, your brand is typically something uh, which you trademark in India. Uh, nonetheless, most of your clientele happens to be, let's say, in the US or UK or Australia or other countries. Um, the possibility of infringing that brand or the or the trademark also is where your clientele is or where your brand recognition is right so in that case uh, and all of these ips typically are territory bound uh, right so it is it makes uh, a better sense to actually procure your ip rights uh, whether it is a trademark then it is in the us it is through a usbt or you can also have a home application and then uh, you can extend that through WIPO or World Intellectual Property Organization. So there is a Madrid protocol in place. Uh, so you could you could extend that to other countries. If it is a patent, then you can go through a PCT, um, which also uh, is a way to extend your patent uh, rights to other countries. And so you should definitely explore that and make sure that the land that you actually have the largest exposure of uh, uh, of misuse uh, possibilities of the brand uh, or the technology uh, that you have patented, uh, you get uh, security in that particular land because it is geographically uh, bounded. Uh, and finally, you know, as I said, whether it is an Indian company or it is a foreign company, uh, you always make sure that you are legally protected by the right type of contracts and agreements in place. Um, also, a lot of times, um, when your contract happens in the foreign entity's name, you also have a lot of sensitive information that is uh, given to the employees of the Indian organization. So in that case, obviously, your employment contract or otherwise should talk about the data privacy uh, or, uh, you know, confidentiality of data that you, uh, you know, pass on. Uh, for the critical information that you share with your employees or the or the contractor contractors and subcontractors so it becomes very important uh, to secure yourself with right set of contracts in in uh, you know whether it is a non disclosure agreement or whether that is a uh, you know data privacy um, you know mechanism that that you have in place um, that becomes extremely important uh, so you don't have to take the burden um, you know of uh, you know, of any breach in that contract. And if you have subcontracted that to any other Indian company or, or if that is being exposed to your employees, but it is a critical information, you make sure uh, that it stays secured um, uh, in, in that manner through the right set of contracts being in place. Um, so these are some of the points, um, you know, that I would want everyone to consider uh, first of all obviously does it make sense to incorporate in foreign land uh, if uh, if your advantages are outweighing your cost and compliance burdens then obviously it does make sense uh, if it is solving a purpose uh, if you do so then uh, one uh, primarily figure out which country second you figure out which establishment type and uh, third is how do you structure an arrangement between your Indian entity and the foreign land entity, whether that is a parent subsidiary or those are two different entities, but you still have a contractual, uh, you know, relationship between the two. Uh, and, uh, and, and you manage that or navigate that, that through the contracts uh, that becomes uh, a key structure, uh, you know, obviously, uh, and most of the countries will have uh, uh, very different criteria to that. And so it becomes very important to have somebody who knows about that particular uh, country's rules and regulations and law and understands that enough to guide you uh, in, a, in a better fashion. So uh, with that, I think I end my presentation for today. And, uh, uh, you know, obviously some of the other things that you kind of consider is some of the countries like Singapore has a requirement of having a uh, you know, local or Dubai also has a requirement of having a local representation, um, you know, as one local director, at least, um, uh, versus US is a more, you know, sort of open uh, market wherein uh, an international or a non-national, uh, you know, person can also uh, open a corporation uh, very easily. You just need a registered agent service or an RA service, which is mandatory uh, to keep track of your, uh, you know, governance related compliances, related communication with the government and so on and so forth. So, so every country has very different, you know, set of rules and uh, becomes very wise to have somebody who knows that 
very specifically and execute that uh, you know through them uh, with that i think i would uh, hand it over to pugal ji and uh, definitely very happy to answer any questions uh, if you guys have thanks a lot sriji for going through the need to establish an entity overseas um managing steps in incorporating a foreign entity and processes related to everything compliance i hope it's been an insightful session for our audience as well um next i have mr pugal who would be covering aspects of technology and tools that can be leveraged by an it smb to expand their glo businesses globally let me give a little brief about him before i hand it over to mr pugal ji um he has 38 years of wide ranging experience in field of accounts in entry statutory and trading and is also the founder of potential solutions mr pugal has been associated with tally solutions private limited for the past 15 years as an associate vice president and has shouldered various responsibilities in the organization with core deliverables on domain and product training and conducting sessions representing tally since 2017 Uh, once again, if you're interested in asking for the questions, please feel free to drop in your questions in the Q&A section, and uh, our panels will take it over uh, at the end of the session. Over to you, Mr. Pogul. Thank you, thank you, Sharani, and uh, thank you, Sri J, for giving a wonderful uh, insight into the nuances and the compliance part, especially regarding the you know establishing an entity overseas. So I'll take up from Sri J, and then. i am i am going to talk about how you what is the technology that you have for you to manage this operation expand nationally and globally so i have a small presentation let me just quickly share the presentation okay Tally has been a technology partner for, especially for our Indian uh, SMEs for the last thirty-six years, and uh, we have been providing technology solution for business operations for our businesses in our country. So, on the same line, as an organization, if you are planning to expand uh, nationally or globally, very important thing that is required is. that you need to have a technology which can uh, very important thing is that you need to have an integrated technology which can take care of your operations expansion growth without you know being an hassle for you to you know concentrate on what what kind of technology or what kind of uh, you know tools that are required for you to grow uh is one very important thing that you need to you know consider especially when you are you know in on an expansion uh, mode okay. so tally as a technology if you see we have we have you know uh, a integrated solution for the global reach also like for example if you see uh for you to go into a global uh, area then you know tally as a technology has a module or a feature which can handle your export and import also the next thing is that very important thing that once you are in uh, in 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 the international uh, commerce uh, you would be dealing in multi currency with different currencies and uh, the second aspect is that the foreign exchange forex gain or loss so how do you manage them so this whole thing of you are managing your uh international commerce along with handling the currencies and taking care of the uh, forex gain or loss is handled by tally and very important thing is that like uh, cj has mentioned and all of you also are aware that you know once you are into export then irrespective of your threshold limit you are supposed to mandatorily register under gst now gst compliance again especially for your national uh, commerce and international commerce you you will be registered under gst and it is very very important and of late we have been seeing that the kind of uh, you know the the uh, technological marvel that gst gstn is bringing 
right so very very less compared to uh, 2017 five years back when gst was introduced you know we know the kind of struggle the way we had gone through and today you really don't have to do anything i mean like all your input gets auto populated and every information gets auto populated in your system so similarly all your export related information if you have an integrated technology which can take care of your accounting need nationally and internationally in case of a trader inventory management system and very important for both the entities the gst compliance part of it so you have all this put together into the system which you are not going to do multiple iterative data capture it is going to be one single data capture that you are going to uh, you know capture the data in tally now how do we handle multi currency like for example we have this multi currency feature in tally where you can have not just one uh, foreign currency you can have multiple currencies and also you will have where you can specify standard rate based on your sales uh, and the amount that you have received your selling rate and uh, buying rate gets automatically populated in the system and it is going to apply these rates accordingly and that is how tally is going to also keep track of the forex gain or loss and not just one multi currency you can have multiple whichever country you are dealing in you can have multiple uh, you know foreign currencies created and the best part in tally is you also have the option of cross currency transaction so you can bill it in uh, us dollar let's say to a to, to a customer in uae you are billing in us dollar but then you are going to get the remittance through the aed from uh, your customer I mean, even those kind of transactions is handled based on the exchange rate that gets auto populated on the transaction basis or you can set it up using your standard cost so that way it, it you know basically takes care of your multi currency requirement from 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 your billing perspective and from billing perspective again the gst has got certain criteria that has been specified the kind of information that needs to be captured uh, or printed on the invoice like you know and uh, uh, mr cj had mentioned about uh, export is normally is going to be a zero rated uh, transaction but then you know you need to have an lut or bond and normally today i mean like getting an lut is very very simple in gst portal you must have experience so in tally once you have an lut you can specify the detail so that you know i mean like you know your taxation part is taken care and the required information that needs to be captured like if you see here you 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 are billing this in uh, dollars and the information that needs to be captured is you have to mention that you you are supplying to an SEZ through LUT or or an export so this is the caption that needs to be captured which auto get, gets auto populated when you are generating your invoice for your export and this is another invoice where you can do an invoicing in the UAE currency AED billing can be done and like I mentioned you will get the cross currency uh, transaction managed in tally then comes your e invoicing i mean uh, in export though i mean basically you don't have this e invoicing especially but then for your local or your national invoicing tally again has an integrated system where within the software you can generate your e invoice by click of a button so as a tally user i'm sure many of you present here uh, our tally users i mean like it is just simple it just takes hardly two minutes for you to enable e-invoicing once you are falling under the e-invoicing thing and we all of us are aware that from first of october the threshold limit is reduced to 10 crores so every entity in any of the last three years if their turnover is 10 crores and above so they will be falling under e-invoice uh, generation for b2b transactions so the normal way that you do entry in tally you do the entry in tally and all you have to do is that tally is going to ask you do you want to generate e invoice you're going to just press yes and there is one small registration you need to do and you will capture the username and password in tally at the beginning of the day it is going to remain 
uh, throughout the day. And then every time you don't have to keep logging in. And all you're going to do is just enter the username, password in the software and do your normal billing and say you want to generate uh, e-invoice. Uh, Tally is going to automatically export the data in the required file format. It is going to upload the data on the GST portal and then it is going to fetch the 64 digit uh, IRN acknowledgement number, acknowledgement date and the QR code. Now this is the default Tally. The user need not have to do any additional uh, you know, customization or anything. This is the normal Tally that you are using. Your e-invoice uh, e gets automatically generated through Tally from within the software. Then GST return again is a very important aspect. I mean, like uh, some of you, I mean, like must have heard through your uh, you know uh, business call colleagues that you know they would be getting a notice of the turnover that is declared in GSTR three B is not matching with the GSTR one return, right? So and basically the reason is the primary reason is that you know as a user the person is not using a single system for capturing their accounting information and. GST compliance related information that is where you know basically you have this kind of a mismatch in some cases but once you enable GST and start utilizing the GST feature in tally it is going to be integrated so absolutely the data that is captured in your sales invoice or in your purchase invoice for your input tax credit all information is going to be single data which is going to be reflected in various form including the annual return form Okay, so that is one aspect of it and all the user needs to do is just pass the transaction in the normal way that you are passing a sale entry or a purchase entry and with a small configuration tally is going to identify what is the nature of transaction uh, that particular uh, data is getting captured based on that tally is going to capture that information and it is going to populate in either GSTR 3B or in GSTR 1 uh, under the respective tables. Like for example, if you see here, the outward taxable supply, which is at zero rated is the export invoice that has been raised by the user and it automatically gets captured in the GSTR 3B. And at the same time, it also captures under GSTR 1, which is going to be the same value. The next aspect is that one, yes, global reach, how, how does Tally as a technology is going to help you so that, you know, you are seamlessly able to keep moving forward or, you know, seamlessly able to, uh, as you are growing, you know, Tally is allowing you for an incremental uh, implementation of your growth through the technology without, without any major hassles for you to manage your operations. So one is the, the the global reach. The other other important critical aspect is that how using Tally as a technology effectively you can manage your operations. Okay. So one of the most important thing post COVID we are all aware that you know the most important thing for any business uh, is working capital, which is, which is basically determined by my cash flow. So how much are we on top of our top of our cash flow management, uh, especially during this period, it is very, very important and critical. So with, with the help of Tally, I mean, like with the help of this Tally features that are available, it is very easy, very simple for the entities to have uh, an, a, a near accu accurate cash projections. Like, uh, for example, with proper Tally also has a feature of billwise detail, which is going to manage the receivable and payable management and if you are able to manage them with the proper based on your credit policy with your proper uh, bill wise detail with your proper credit uh, days and all those things you are able to now actually you know incorporate all those receivables and payables based on the dates which these amounts are falling to so that is the major aspect of your cash flow movement the second aspect of it is that you will be having uh, you know, uh, regular, uh, uh, you know, transactions or, 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 or uh, monthly uh, repeated transactions, which, which, which relates to your, you know, a fixed cost, like, you know, your salaries or rent and other things. If you are not bringing them into the, the cash flow projection, then the cash flow projection is not going to give you a proper thing. So there is an option in Tally where you can all your recurring expenses or your income, you can capture them as a 
provisional transactions, which means these transactions which are going to happen at a future point in time is not going to get impacting your books of account. But then those provisional transactions that you are going to capture will be incorporated into your cash flow projections and it is going to give you the proper cash flow month on month so that you know you are well prepared to meet any any consequences which 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 are you know you know throwing information about what what is the situation going to be at a later point in time and this whole thing can be managed by click of a button um, this is just a simple thing, i mean uh, screen which which basically going to project you the cash cash flow projections based on your receivables payables and also the the provisional transactions that you have captured so these are the provisional transactions, even though the data is here only till July. If you notice here, all the provisional transactions example taken is rent and salary for the entire year it is considered and this whole amount gets populated into the cash flow projections and it gives you the proper cash flow. The second very important aspect, which, which I believe personally most of the businesses ignore is the hidden cost and there are various hidden costs. I'm talking about a very, very important hidden cost, which is the money that is being outstanding beyond your credit period. The amount of interest that you are losing is, is, you know, generally ignored by many of the businesses, right? And, 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 and this is something which is not going to get reflected in, in our, you know, in <clears throat> profit and loss account or income statement. Right. And which, which definitely is going to hit our bottom line. Right. So again, Tally has a beautiful feature called interest calculation where it is, you know, this feature is like, you know, it's like a game of what if, what if this customer is not paying me, uh, you know, beyond the period specified for credit days and the number of days which is being overdue, what is the interest that I'm losing? You might not charge interest to your party, but then at least this information is going to give you an insight of what is the amount of, you know, the return on investment we are losing. And we are all aware that any credit that we extend to a customer is as good as giving them an interest-free loan. So you would have a credit policy based on various uh, criteria that you apply. And it is very important for you to make sure that you are able to collect them within your credit period so that, you know, these hidden costs is not going to really, you know, pull your bottom line down. Okay. So <clears throat> you have this tracking of uh, loss of uh, return on investment and the feature that is there is interest collection. It is very, very simple. All you need to do is you go to each party and then say, what is the interest that you want to levy? Like 9%, 10% per annum you want to levy. And that's all you're going to do. Rest everything tally is going to take care. So the moment you just do that, you go to a report, tally is going to give you a report. And these are the outstanding amount which are overdue. And Based on your credit period, for example, you have given a credit period of 30 days. You make an invoice on 1st of uh, the month. So 30 days credit you are giving. So let's say April 1st, you make an invoice, 30 days credit. The amount is due on 1st of May. And from 1st of May, this company, if you see the data, current date is 20th of July. So from 1st of May till 20th of July, on the overdue amount, based on the rate of interest that you have specified, Tally is going to calculate and then it is going to give you the amount of interest that you are losing. And if you see, there is one arrow there, the third line item, if you notice here, even though there is no outstanding, it is still showing you that there is an amount of interest that you are losing. So what Tally does, any amount that is cleared, which might not be due as on today, but then the amount gets cleared beyond the credit period. So even though those amounts tally calculates the interest and you are going to get this value of interest that is there. So this will definitely give you an idea of how you can manage your uh, client base or customers. And then what 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 is the kind of credit policy that you want to do? It gives you more clarity on managing your outstanding uh, amounts. And then the last one is again, you have a very, very important report, which is the real time health checkup, right? So at any given point in time, you can go to this particular report. This report in tally is called as ratio analysis. And this report is going to basically give you certain principal group information and also the principal ratios, 
like you know what is your working capital and it also gives you this is one report which is going to give you information which form part of balance sheet and also forms part of profit and loss account so you have all this information the, the certain information that you're going to get if you notice here the value is different it says sunday data says 19.15 lakh but whereas due to today is 11.23 so the total sunday data is 19.15 but as on today based on your credit policy you are supposed to receive 11.23 so like this lot of information insights you get now what is what is your working capital turnover how effectively you are using your working capital so the formula is given here so you would know that how well you are able to utilize your working capital now the figure here is not really encouraging or not really rosy because it is the the, the company here is able to do their working capital turnover just 0.36% so ideally it should be 1 or 1 plus so like this, you know, you have on, on by click of a button, you will know exactly what is your gross profit, what is your net profit, what is your operating cost. You will also see turnover received, receivable. How much time does it take for you overall for you to collect the money from your customers, which are outstanding and various other ratios are there, which is going to be very helpful to you when, especially when you're going for any funds with the external agencies. Broadly, if you see Tally as a technology has a complete solution for the business operations, which can take care of their financial requirement, inventory requirement, and very important is the compliance aspect of it, which all three of them gets integrated with one single interface and capturing of data through a single interface. So that's, that's these are a few things from my end. Again, if there's any questions, we will we will take it up. Uh, over to you, Shalini. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pugulji. Uh, thank you, Pugulji, for uh, going through the importance and various model modules covering different aspects of operations to expand nationally and globally, and handling commerce with multiple currency, handling GST returns, and even tracking an important aspect of hidden costs. Thank you so much, Pugulji, for that. Let's um, go over the questions that we've received. So the first one is um, a question asking, I think uh, pertains to Sriji. Uh, do we have any indemnity insurance in India? So the attendee here provides uh, IT services to UK and US companies. And one of their customers was asking about the indemnity insurance and wants to understand what kind of options we have in India in case there is an issue made by one of their teammates, the attendee's teammates. Would that be covered by the insurance provider? You're on mute. Um, so, uh, professional indemnity or, uh, uh, you know, uh, indemnity insurances are uh, very common. Um, and uh, a lot of uh, trades that happen in an international market, uh, a lot of your US or other Western countries' clients would. Uh, require such insurances in place. Uh, in India, also there are insurance companies that would provide you uh, professional liability insurances. Uh, it essentially what 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 it does is um, it covers you from um, you know any liability that occurs um, for the reason of negligence from your employees or um, if it is uh, you know. Um, if it is a genuine mistake that has happened and it is not deliberate, uh, it would cover you for the financial potential financial losses that your end client has to uh, bear um, because of uh, the negligence, um, you know, on on your professional part, which also covers your team. Uh, if you would want to procure an insurance, uh, I know there are a lot of insurance companies that provide a professional liability insurance in India. Uh, I would ideally simply suggest, you know, go on an aggregator website like uh, Policy Bazaar uh, and search for the professional liability insurance or uh, indemnity insurance for professionals. And uh, uh, there are plenty of options that are available at a, at a minimal premium, uh, which would cover you, uh, you know, with the requirement. Sometimes also client has this uh, as a prerequisite. Uh, and sometimes it is also just good to have because uh, a lot of IT companies uh, deal with a lot of uh, 
um, you know, a lot of sensitive or, uh, you know, information that can be categorized as uh, confidential. So, uh, so that's definitely there. Uh, apart from the insurance, you would also, as I told earlier, you would want to make sure that it becomes a confidentiality, uh, becomes a standard clause in your contracts, whether you are subcontracting that work or you are, uh, you are drafting employment contracts, obviously, you know, make sure that the liabilities that you inherit in your service level agreements also is further passed on to the to the contracts that you further do to uh, you know get subcontractors or uh, employees who would work on that so that is always uh, you know always a better way to manage that uh, i hope that uh, that answers <clears throat> okay um another question from the same attendee actually um, as an IT service provider, again, operating from India and servicing the customers from yes. UK and US market, if any of the team member from their team made any data security breach unknowingly, how does the customer handle the issue legally? So the customer obviously can, uh, if it is a negligence from your team side, then the customer obviously can uh, sue you for a breach of contract in terms of data security. Um, and uh, they can claim the damages, whether those damages are in literal sense or it has damaged their brand or it has damaged uh, in terms of uh, leaking of secured information, uh, which has a potential financial loss in terms of uh, their market share drop or the financial losses in terms of prospected sales that they have out of that product and it, it being compromised because the confidential information, whether that is a trade secret or that is, um, you know, any sort of technological aspects that they would want to keep it secret uh, and that has gone out. So, uh, so definitely there can be a legal consequence of that. And uh, uh, for that, uh, I think uh, it is in connection with the previous question where a professional liability insurance is definitely a wiser, you know, way to manage that. Um, you know, at the same time, having the right contracts in place uh, is is important. Thank you, Shijay. Just one last question. Mm -hmm. If the service provider's registered office is only in India, but it's trading with US customers and the MSA is agreed with the California jurisdiction, will that case affect Indian entity legally? It will. So a jurisdiction is something where uh, essentially you define that if at all there is a dispute, uh, that uh, that occurs, uh, then what is the legal jurisdiction or what are the courts that uh, we are going to go to to defend that case, right? So in case you have you have defined Californian courts as the jurisdiction, then obviously it becomes more advantageous to your client than you because you have to fight it out in a foreign land. And that is why a lot of times when you are drafting a service agreement, you if you have um, an opportunity of or if you have a weighing, uh, then you should always have the jurisdiction set as the local Indian jurisdiction. So it becomes easier for you to defend that. Uh, nonetheless, not a lot of uh, clients really, uh, you know, agree to that. So, uh, so it becomes, you know, a point of negotiation and, and uh, you know, how much uh, weighing that you have uh, versus how much desperate you are to kind of get that contract. Thank you, Shree Thank you so much for answering the questions and thank you for uh, to our speaker panel and all our attendees for taking out the time to attend this webinar today. I hope it's been insightful to all our attendees in some way or form. Um, before we end the session, I would urge all our attendees to please share their feedback at the end of the session. And if there's anything you'd like us to talk about in our next webinar series, please, we'd be happy to take in the suggestion. And if there's any feedback, how we can improve, uh, please drop in your feedback there as well. So once we end the webinar, you'll see a feedback form. And just in case you're wondering, we'll also share the recording of this webinar uh, either by tomorrow or the early next week. So those of you who have joined late and have a, like want to understand a little more, uh, please feel free to access the recording. Um, thank you so much, Sriji and Pugulji. Uh, and thank you to all our attendees for joining in. I hope these insights do help you. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much thank for you. helping thank us. You. Having us. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Sriji. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shani. Bye. Thanks, all attendees. Thank you very much.